Today we begin learning about culture. I first want to start off and ask you, how did you learn how to tie a shoe? Perhaps you had an older sibling, a parent, or someone else teach you. You might be one of those who taught yourself. How did you learn your ABCs? Many people point to the ABC song or television show like Sesame Street or someone else who taught them how. What about standing in line? If you go out and you happen to see a kindergarten class or another group of small children, one of the things that you'll note is that their teachers work with them very, very hard to make sure that they learn how to stand in line. And that is being a part of how we navigate through things. Standing in line is one of those things that we learn early on and it becomes important to us in the culture here in the United States. For example, if you were in this long line from this particular vantage point and someone walks past everyone else and gets to the front of your line, how would you feel? You'd probably be irritated and maybe even more than that, angry with them. There probably would be a noticeable protest among the people standing in line. Why? Because for us, our idea of standing in line and fairness and waiting your turn are strongly embedded in the culture here in the United States. And it's something that we guard very seriously and take very seriously. So you've heard me say that this is a lecture about culture. What is culture? Here's a definition. Culture is the shared socially learned knowledge and patterns of behavior of a group. There's some things that are important here. We're going to unpack this definition first that it's shared, meaning that it there's a collective involved. It's shared by some group of people. We keep the some group of people deliberately vague because culture can this this culture and the shared aspect of culture crosses geographic lines, racial lines, economic lines. There are many, many ways in which they pass that. And if you look at these people here, they are obviously part of a subculture, and that is fans of the University of Memphis Tigers. We know that when we say that culture is shared, there are some important elements that we have to also talk about. The first is because culture is shared, we're able to interact and communicate without a lot of misunderstanding or the need to constantly explain what the particular behavior means. For example, again, if we talk about Memphis, University of Memphis students, then saying things or talking about things such as the semester, dorms, comps, quads, RAs, the yard, fraternities, sororities are things that don't require a lot of explanation among people who share the same culture. We have a common cultural identity. That means that we recognize ourselves and our traditions as being distinct from other people and their traditions. We know that culture also, though, is shared yet contested. It's constantly tested. We're always negotiating and changing. There are debates over things like school curriculums, medical practices, media content, religious practices, and government practices as members of a culture engage in sometimes dramatic confrontations about their collective purpose and direction. We know that culture, again, the process of it being socially learned is that when we say that, we're talking about that it's acquired by individuals in the process of growing up. The process by which we learn our culture is called enculturation. And that's the process by which a child learns his or her culture. Culture is learned directly. Culture is learned by observation. 
One thing that we know that if you have children around and you don't want them to repeat something that they see, don't do it around them because children are very big observers and they're like sponges and they watch and listen to what we say and what we do and oftentimes then begin imitating the behavior that we display. Cultures learn unconsciously. There are ways in which we learn about what it means to be a member of a culture without anyone explicitly telling us or saying to us, this is what to do, this is what not to do. But there are things that we pick up on, various cultural clues that are a part of being in a particular culture. Culture is also taught. We know that things that are available for teaching institutions that are established for enculturation, such as schools, medical system, the media, religious institutions, many other places where we find they promote the concepts that are central to cultures. We know that there are rules, regulations, laws, teachers, doctors, religious leaders, police officers, and sometimes even the military that promote and enforce what is considered appropriate behavior and thinking. The rules and regulations that are there are oftentimes posted in places such as this fitness centers rules and other places. There are other signs and other things that are done that share information on what expected behavior is and what it means again to be a part of a particular of a particular culture we also have what we call cultural knowledge and there are several components to cultural knowledge cultural knowledge is a behavior that is meaningful to others and adaptive to the natural and social environment and the factors that go into cultural knowledge norms those are shared ideas about or rules about how people ought to act in certain situations or toward particular other people for example a norm might be um, what to wear to funerals or what to wear to weddings what to wear to work what to wear to school how younger people should treat older people and how older people should treat younger people those are examples of norms that we carry in our culture the second are values and those are beliefs of people's beliefs about the goals or way of life that is desirable for themselves and for their society and we hear an awful lot of talk about values but they are how people see society and those things that they consider to be important in terms of the goals of way of life considered desirable classifications of reality shared ideas of what kinds of things and people exist how many of you believe in ghosts if you are one of those who do a part of your classification classification of reality then would be that you believe that ghosts and maybe other kinds of entities such as that exist and conduct your life accordingly and depending upon those things and those people and not just something like a ghost but just in general the kinds of things that we feel exist will be how we conduct our lives our worldview is closely related to classifications of reality but that's how we interpret reality and events how we see ourselves as relating to the world around us so again as we continue in our study of culture we'll talk more about the worldview symbols is something that we'll talk about with regard to language language itself is a collection of symbols even the words that are on this slide are a collection of symbols that you are able to identify and that you know are a part of language and you are a part of the whole collective of agreeing that these particular letters and these particular combinations mean these particular words in English but again it's really a collection of symbols both written and spoken that language is all about and I know that oftentimes people may drive in a way that appears as if they don't know what this particular traffic 
We say sign, but ultimately it's a symbol. What it means, we know, of course, it's a yield sign. But a symbol is something that's verbal or nonverbal that stands for something else. And this sign again being for the symbol being for yield. So what does this particular symbol mean? Depending upon your culture again, it can mean anything from hang loose. It can be sometimes people will take their hand and make the symbol and then turn it slightly to say call, indicate call me or signal call me to someone. There are groups that use this in particular fraternity, uh, one of the historically black fraternities, Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. This is their particular symbol. It can mean a variety of other things depending upon the country that you're in. But one of the things that's important about symbols is that they're arbitrary, meaning they have no inherent qualities that will cause groups to attribute meaning to them other than the fact that the group decides to do so. What one symbol means in one culture can mean something totally different in another, or it might mean nothing at all. Things that are um, also important about symbols is that they're also conventional, meaning that they have, they have meaning only because people implicitly agree. You could take this symbol, you could take a stop signal, for example, and the fact that red means stop, yellow means caution, green means go. Those are, again, conventional because people implicitly agree. You can have a totally different culture that may decide that red means go and green means stop and yellow means caution or in any combination of those things. But because people agree, that's what gives the symbol its meaning and what gives symbol its power.